we're here to talk a bit about um, what this film brings up. It's definitely, a, I would say, a narrative of a healing journey for uh, Dinesh and his family. Mental illness, suicide, grief, search for meaning, all those things are, are wound into this film and it provides a, quite a bit of good material for reflecting and understanding. And that's what we're gonna talk about a bit tonight. Um, the first thing for the panel would be to ask you, what does the film tell us um, about what it means to grow up with a parent who has mental illness or about what it's like to experience mental illness? So, Whoever? Well, I'll go ahead and start. Um, thank you for all of you who actually have joined us today for this conversation and thank you for the introduction. Um, it, you know, it's been a real pleasure to see the film grow um, and the work that Dinesh has done in regard to Unbroken Glass, partly because from the perspective I come, I want to sort of ground um, all of you in terms of, you heard a little bit about my bio, but I'm not a clinical um, psychologist, um, but a lot of the work that I have been doing at, is looking at these issues of stigma and, and silence that very much is a part of what you saw in this film and the element of how stigma plays a role in unbroken glass is very significant. Particularly when it comes from a perspective of going back into time and hearing from different family members in regard to, and Dinesh's perspective in regard to what it was like living with mental illness in, in the family. I think this is a challenging element of the work that we really need to do and the fact that the film does serve as a catalyst of how do we bring these stories out in the beginning rather than having to rewind to be able to have a conversation as this film allows us to do. So I'll start off with that. I would love you know, for us to sort of bounce off of that comment, possibly. Um, sure thing. Aruna. Barbara, I'd like to go back to the substantive area of your question. So I am uh, trained in mental health, and I've worked with chronically mentally ill individuals and families that are coping with that, not just dealing with that. I think what happens uh, when you have a seriously or a chronically mentally ill individual as a loved one, the entire family system gets stretched. And it's, it's a struggle to find the right kinds of resources to meet the challenges on a daily basis. Some of that is covered in this film. Some of that is not because it is ultimately the presentation of a journey of an individual, Dinesh in this case, who was barely six years old at that time and is now trying to recreate the narrative of his mother's life. So I do want to point out that in this film, it's not only about mental illness, it's about the coming together of many different stressors, not the least of which is being an immigrant in a strange land. One of, the, one, of the, one of the pieces that jumps out at me every time that I see this film, and I've seen it a number of times, is the issue of broken dreams, distorted narratives. You know, um, as a documentarian, I think, Dinesh, you've done a wonderful job of capturing the essence of that. What must it have been like to be 19 years old and already been admitted to the school of your choice, and then to be told by your family that you were going to be married and sent abroad, you know, whereas you may not have wanted to go abroad in the first place. And so I think I'd like to come in here from the perspective of not just mental illness, but mental illness in immigrant families and immigrant communities. It's the issue of constantly setting aside your own aspirations. And Dinesh's aunt reflects on that when she said, she kept writing to us that I only wanted to be free. 
I only want, I always wanted to be free. What was she trying to be free from? And was it necessarily mental illness? So what we know about schizophrenia and what we know about chronic mental illness, and Barb, feel free to add your own bits to it, um, is that you may have a predisposition to mental illness, but you, you would never manifest the, the symptoms if the environment was conducive. You know, at least 30% of the possible population of people who have a predisposition to mental illness will never, never, ever manifest the, the symptoms, you know. And some people may not have a genetic predisposition to mental illness, but because of circumstances, will become chronically and seriously mentally ill. And there are traces of that in the narrative in this film, and it takes a, lot, a person of great courage, like Dinesh, to even go in those directions. And uh, I'm sure you all picked it up, but I'd like to just sort of repeat those segments. It's very hard for a survivor of the loss of someone who's died by suicide to go towards the possibility of domestic violence, you know. Uh, whether it was delusional or whether it was reality of infidelity in marriage. Where does an individual go with that level of anguish, that level of trauma? You know, so there are, there are passages in the story that are heartbreaking of a mother of very young children trying to escape possibly a situation of domestic violence going away for two to three weeks at a time, and then returning because she has no resources. Where could she go? But in addition to that, I'd like to bridge it to what um, Rushi is talking about. It is the stigma. In um, conservative families, and not just immigrant families, but conservative families who may be American, depending on the code of honor and the code of conduct that the particular family has, Certain choices are absolute no-nos. And so what does that do to a person who is faced with no options? It could very often become a trigger for serious depression. It could become a trigger for psychosis, which might manifest as what other people see as schizophrenia. So when we, when we try to piece it together, and neither uh, the nation's mom nor her, his father are alive to really help us understand, there is only one piece of truth to go by, which is that there was a family history of schizophrenia. And that is why one is going with a diagnosis of schizophrenia. But I would like to sort of just point out that mental health diagnoses are labels that are trying to describe behavior so that professionals within themselves you know, understand what the behaviors are. But for the average person, it is the issue of just trying to love and live with an individual who's in deep, deep pain and is struggling, and ultimately makes a choice to actually end that life of pain and agony. Well said. I, so where does that leave us? Because there is a family like your family. There's multiple families out there today. Where does that leave us then? How can um, families today, where do they start? What's different now than when you were growing up and when your mother was going through that? What's different today? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really know. Um, actually, one thing, one thing that really strikes me is how little has changed. How you know, my mother, her story was happening in the 70s and 80s. And, you know, here I come 20 years later, uh, 30 years later, and, you know, trying to capture it. And I'm, I'm dealing with very similar amounts of stigma. And actually, Rishi, maybe you can talk about, you know, what, how, how stigma kind of played a role in, in all of that. Well, I, you know, I think, you know, to tie that, that very important question about, you know, has it changed? I, I think the reality is, is no, it hasn't. Your your parents came to this country in the 19... In the late 60s, yeah. 60s, yeah. right? And we are right now in the year 2016. And 
being someone like myself, I also come from a South Asian background. I have a Pakistani Indian background with some Middle Eastern ties. And I can tell you that just from our connections within my own family, and, and really comparing it to your, your own family story, this element of having any conversations at the table about the dynamics of what this film brings out and that adjustment of coming from a South Asian country like India or Pakistan, which was very true of our family and my mother, who did not speak a word of English when she came into this country with my father. And, and the fact, and, and both of us, so I was not born in this country, nor was my sister. My sister was born in Pakistan. Um, I was born in Canada. But my mother's isolation because of language, but also because of the lack of ties to any family at mm -hmm. that time. That was the 1960s. But the fact that you know we have continuously met with other families, as well as our own family, the, the issues of depression, anxiety, adjustment to a new life, that's very different from the life of living in a home country where you do have ties to family, you have ties to extended family, you have ties to communities of various sorts. That reality continues to be a very difficult reality for, for many families, whether you're South Asian or um, I do a lot of work with the Asian American communities, multicultural communities in the context of disability, which is very much in line to looking at issues of mental illness, mental health. I think, Aruna, you, 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 know, you bring up a very good point about what does mental illness look like within a family? Mm -hmm. Because we have different terminology, those of us who speak different languages, that don't quite translate mm -hmm. into descriptors or labels that may be used in the Western community when it comes to mental health issues. Some of those words don't exist. It's more maybe descriptors or it's not discussed. And, and families adjust and, and the, the resiliency of your family in what you were experiencing, I think, um, as, a, as a young boy, and then your siblings in their role you know, what was the dynamic in your relationship or your siblings' relationship with your mother and your father? Um, and, you know, what was the relationship of your older siblings in regard to this dynamic? Um, I think there's a lot of quietness and silence within yeah. families, yeah. insular to these issues, and issues that don't often come out openly. And we do need to start shifting that through stories. The, 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 the art of filmmaking or collecting narratives that don't exist around this issue when it comes to culture, immigrant experiences, mental illness or mental health. This film is amazing in that it can promote a dialogue that often does not happen. In, in, in this arena. Yeah. But just to respond to a couple of things you're saying, and, and also to connect it back to your question, Barbara, um, I think the immigrant experience itself, kind of writ large, has changed quite a bit since the, since the late 60s. I think the internet has made things, you know, it's possible for, you know, I see a lot of South Asian immigrants um, to come here and really remain very closely tied to their families mm -hmm. in ways that my parents were not able to. Yes. So they were, pretty isolated growing up, or they were living in, you know, Louisiana in a, in a very small town, and there were, you know, maybe a handful of other Indians that they could connect with, but it was still very, very close-knit, very small, whereas I think today you see um, really a lot of, you know, th with the internet, et cetera, um, a lot of communication back and forth, people are able to come and really retain a lot of a sense of culture, a sense of identity, of, of where they, they came from. The other really big change um, is, I think, I think uh, medicines have gotten a lot better in the last 30, 40 years. Um, 
I did, you know, I did a bit of research as to the kind of things that might were being prescribed to my mother. Um, we kind of hint in one scene about uh, she did undergo some ECT when she was in India, which is electroconvulsive therapy, which I believe is still used today. Um, it's making a comeback even in the U.S. actually, yeah. and. Um, <clears throat> That is why I was saying that we don't know if it was really schizophrenia sure, or sure. A severe depression with psychotic, psychotic. elements to it. Right, right. Because ECT yeah. is now becoming a, a treatment of choice for severe depression. Gotcha. You know, and um, to the degree that it's helpful to the audience to talk yeah. about these right. things. Okay. But, you know, I, I agree with you, Dinesh, that the internet, but not only, not only that, education levels of, of the women who are now migrating, you know, resources that are um, available to multicultural communities, um, a focus on health disparities, everyone being curious and wanting to learn more about uh, other communities. You know, I, it's all a, a very different world from when your parents migrated. Right. That's one. But there are, unfortunately, still similarities. And one of the big similarities that you've um, alluded to in this film, and I'd like to draw the audience's attention to, is that of the, the gender differential or the gender gap. You know, uh, we have to, unfortunately, recognize that many conservative cultures are very male-dominant, chauvinistic cultures. And particularly when a man goes back to his country of origin and brings a wife to the United States, by the very nature of migration, that woman is at a disempowered state as compared to her husband. You know, she doesn't, she doesn't know the neighbors, she doesn't know what the resources are. He's probably been here a lot longer than she has. And those parallels need to be drawn because Dinesh's parents were in exactly the same state. He had come to the United States and he'd gotten a PhD. He was a brilliant scientist. Clearly, his colleague, Manuel, loved him dearly. He was a prolific writer, you know? Mm -hmm. So he goes back to India and marries a 19-year-old girl who's just entering college. Mm -hmm. Because in India, you don't have to do an undergrad to go to med school you go straight to med school. So you can imagine she's just out of high school, you know, and she's going to college. Imagine the power gap between the two of them. So he, he knew everything that he needed to know to be really successful. What did she know? Mm -hmm. And what, we, what I've seen in my work, not only with uh, mental health, but also with domestic violence, is that that's the scenario very often with immigrant families, particularly with Asian families. So, you know, um, the picture that's being painted here, at least for me, is that he was very calm on the outside. He was very efficient on the outside. He got along great with his colleagues. Never, uh, there was never an outburst, right? I think that's what Manuel and his wife were telling you. And yet when he came home, he would, he would lose control and he would beat his wife. Well, I mean, I think it's important to, it, it was a really complicated situation. Yes. And uh, yes, there's a way to tell the story where it's, it, it is just that. But in, if, if, and I kind of addressed this in the voiceover mm -hmm. uh, right after talking to my aunt, you know, they would actually, there was violence being perpetrated on both sides. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was, very, very complicated. This isn't to say that one was right and the other was wrong. Absolutely, I agree but, with you. But, um, you know, I, and the, the other thing is, I don't think he really, at least early on, understood what exactly was happening. Mm -hmm. and, and he was, you know, while he might have been a really brilliant uh, scientist, he was still a, a guy who grew up in a very conservative family mm -hmm. in, in Jaipur, India, and didn't really know how to handle a lot of what was happening um, uh, to him. So, I mean, this is just to make, make more complicated th this point you're making about domestic violence. Sure, Absolutely. because, uh, and, you know, newly married and outside of their, their culture, yeah. who do you go to? 
you know, you have this 19-year-old wife who doesn't know who she is or can't sure. find out because she doesn't have a job or an identity, and how does he deal with that? And, and the men that he could go to aren't available, and same for her. So it's a, a stressful situation right. it, on it, both sides. It cascades into this very, very large right. uh, kind of problem. Right, so we cannot um, ignore the, uh, the cultural component here. Absolutely. We have uh, maybe 15 minutes left. We want to open to the audience for questions or comments. Sure. I cannot see. Yeah. Is there a mic that we can pass around, maybe? Possibly? Um, there's a mic set up. OK, there's a mic set up in the back, it looks like, um, if people want to step up to the microphone. Or you could, if you, you could just yell out a question, too. Just yell out a question? Yeah, just yell it out. Well, I'm curious, you're talking about the isolation? Sure. What were your neighbors or the community that you were in depriving you when you were alone? I shouldn't say you were alone. You, you, you're, when oh, is there? Because it's for the video recording. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Anyway, Sorry, Suzanne. Yeah, really loud. All right. I, in the meantime, I think there is. Is there somebody at the? No, that was just a shadow. <laughs> Look at that. curious about, because you were talking about the isolation, what was the community you were in, what was their response to that situation? How much awareness did they have that that was happening? Yeah. Or did, is that something you kept to yourselves? Uh, okay, so I can answer this question uh, twofold. Uh, after my parents passed away, I was really, again, I'm six years old at the time, so I don't really know what's going on. But I'll tell you, I, the, the, the number of people who came out uh, and just gave us, you know, cooked food for us and expressed condolences. It was really remarkable. I had never seen, you know, I was just a kid of immigrants. I had never seen that that cake with the hole in it, uh, a bunt cake or something. And we got so many bunt cakes, and it was like these are just giant donuts coming out of coming out of any, everywhere. Um, but it was really kind of quite quite shocking to see that level of community coming together because before when my mother was ill and my parents were alive we were very very isolated and this is something you kind of touched at touched at rushi this you know we were isolated as immigrants but even within the immigrant community because my mother's behavior was so strange and my father was you know didn't know how to handle it and ultimately he was a very shy person we even kind of isolated ourselves within the uh, immigrant community. So we were kind of this island. I don't know if you want to yeah. kind of extend that a little bit. All I can say is this is, uh, it's very common in regard to families who have a family member living with mental illness today are not openly sharing those experiences openly um, with their neighbors or certainly within the immigrant communities that they come from, that this issue continu continuously is an issue that remains hidden and insular and is often just not necessarily shared openly in the family, but experienced in the family. We're not talking yeah. openly about the fact that our family member is experiencing a deep level of depression. Now the question is, is looking at research, and many of you may be familiar with this, it, many individuals are not seeking supports and resources to even access and pursue the help that might be useful for an individual is not necessarily taking place. Again, going back to that original question of stigma, there's no easy response to this very important question that you've asked. But we do need to organize ourselves. And one mechanism to do that is really through stories like Unbroken Glass that has come out. But there are multiple stories out there 
and a need for the, the storytelling that needs to come, mm -hmm. come out. So how do we break away from that? And, and then really quickly, the second half of the answer to that question, where'd you go, Suzanne? Oh, I, uh, I said Oh, you said it down. The second half is, you know, the community after my parents passed away. And just very quickly, um, we were already kind of raised on that island, and that's kind of what we knew. And so we ended up becoming very close to each other, but uh, this is the South, this is Louisiana in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, we didn't really connect with a lot of the, the, the larger community. And so we kind of grew up in kind of continuing the, the isolation that we just were, we were used to, that we were taught. Um, I, go ahead. Go oh. ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to thank Dinesh. Um, I felt like a lot of the um, parts of your film really resonated with my Didu and Dadu's story um, and their marriage. So I just wanted to first off thank you um, for sharing your story. Um, You're welcome. My question is, you've all already kind of started to answer it, is um, personally um, just growing up in the West, uh, how you dealt with um, coming to terms with this story and figuring it out and in your interviews, if there was a difference um, when talking about mental health with your subjects in India versus your subjects here in America? Yeah. I mean, I, so I'll say, I, I think it took making the film to really reconcile my, uh, my Indian identity and really fully embrace. And you can see, you know, there's that moment where I'm, I'm kind of at, at my cousin's wedding and I'm getting the the turban wrapped and I'm, I'm saying, you know, when I grew up, I, I would look in the mirror and I would see this brown kid staring back at me and I didn't really know what to do with that or who that was. So it took a, it took a while to really become fully comfortable and really embrace Indian-ness. Um, and, and that will, that's a very really, you know, I could go into that, but that'll be, that could be another documentary right there. <laughs> um, the, the second part of the question was, I forgot. Um, just sort of when talking specifically about mental health, if oh, there was a difference yeah. in the... If there's a difference between talking to people in India and talking to people in the West. I would say absolutely. I think in the West, you know, there are, you know, a lot of problems with how we talk about mental illness and mental health, but there is at least a baseline acknowledgement that's, that these things exist, that... Um, and that there are treatments, et cetera. People, I, you know, my, the, my more Western family was a lot more inclined to participate. Um, Indian family would, but they had very different ways of explaining what happened with my mother or not explaining what happened with my mother. Um, I should also add that in, in South Asian culture, arranged marriage makes things very, very complicated when talking about mental illness, especially one that might have some kind of hereditary or genetic component. So a number of the extended family I talked to, um, they didn't necessarily want to be on camera because they would always cite their children and their children's wives' families and their not knowing and how if somebody found out that there was this family history of mental illness, they would somehow have felt cheated in the marriage arrangement. I should say that uh, arranged marriage is also very complicated, but it, you know there is this aspect of almost like a business uh, deal to it. Um, it's, it's, it's many more things than that, but but there is that aspect as as well. So that's probably the the, the largest kind of uh, factor in in dealing with kind of East versus West, at least today, Do at you, least in making the film. Can I ask a follow up question? Uh, sure. I guess. Okay. Um, do you? Oh think wait. Yeah. Uh, really quick. Follow. Okay. Sorry. Uh, do you think that that played a role in how you came to terms with your own mental health? Uh, no. Very quick answer, no. Okay. Uh, and we can talk we about it. We can talk it. more. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I think this next one will be the last question, or at least for this panel. Um, I also just wanted to Thank you for your bravery in telling this story. Uh, thank you for sharing. Um, my question is, uh, were there any moments uh, that you found difficult to hit record 
um, did you ever put the camera away out of respect? And then also in the editing room, were there things that were particularly difficult to either leave out or to put in? Yeah, those are great questions. Uh, yes, there, were, there was a lot of stuff that, uh, that my, so my, I would be talking to my sister or my, my extended family and they would ask me to turn the camera off. And I would turn it off. Because um, that's just, you know, I'm a, I'm a human first. I'm their, I'm their family member first. And I, I would turn it off and, and, and put the camera down and talk. Um, there, you know, sometimes that would, that would involve me being able to record and get some version of what was said. Sometimes it wouldn't. Sometimes, you know, it's important. You know, this film isn't necessarily like a one-to-one -one representation of what happened. There are a lot of things that we left out deliberately because it's just, it's maybe at you as an audience, it's not your right to know. Maybe it might have just been too hard for us to, you know, get it in, too hard for me to deal with. I'm going to save the editing question for the next panel, which I believe will be mostly editing or, or about editing. My, actually, Matt, Matt, the project's editor, will be able to answer that kind of in its, in its fullness. Um, so, yeah. I think Matt wants to ask a question. Oh. Man, <laughs> just, get, just, just sit down. Yeah. No, it's a good question. All right. So uh, um, I'm the editor of the film, worked with Dinesh. Um, and it's just really great to hear um, sort of a more high-level academic perspective of a film that we very much created on a gut level. Um, my question is about the siblings. So there's a couple nods to this in the final cut of the film, but it's even more clear in the raw film that Dinesh's siblings have a very different approach to how to handle this history of mental illness in the family. Um, and you know, two siblings in particular really kind of take the head down, move forward, don't think about the past approach. And uh, Dinesh is very much the confront things face on and let's talk about it. And I'm just curious, um, is there a benefit to just head down, move forward, forget about the past? Um, and if so, how does that compare to the benefits of really facing this thing head on? Can I answer that, please? Sure. Yes. Um, Matt, thank you so much for asking that question because I felt like from the from the questions that Barbara had made uh, made up for us, uh, one very important element was missing, and which is the whole issue of surviving suicide. And I think ultimately, in its essence, that's what this documentary is about. And Matt's question allows me to answer that. Um, you know, um, first off, I want to say that in all the presentations that I've done in almost 20 years, there's never been one where there weren't at least a few members of the audience who themselves have directly experienced either the loss of a loved one to suicide or have struggled with suicidal ideation or attempts themselves. So if you're there in the audience, let me say that I feel you. And if you want to talk later, then we are here for you. Um, every survivor, so somebody who's lost a loved one to suicide is a suicide survivor. Everyone's journey is different. And there are several factors that influence how you go forth on that journey. One of the important ones is proximity. You know, how close were you in age or in interaction or at the time of, to the person who died. It doesn't speak to love or anything like that. It's really just proximity. And in this film, there is just a hint of that. But the siblings, correct me if I'm wrong, Dinesh, who chose not to be on camera or who chose just to move on were the older siblings. You know, Dinesh is the youngest among his siblings. Sorry, I have to correct you a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, one, my, my eldest, yes, and then, but then my, my, one of my brothers, he's just a year older than me, and he had the same... He, he had the same reaction. The same approach. So yeah. It's not just proximity, it's one right. of many factors, right. you know, and we honor all the journeys. That's what we're supposed to do. Nobody can tell you how to grieve. You grieve in your own time. But there was a second part to your question, Matt, which one is better, you know, um, again, it's a choice that people are making, just as suicide itself is a choice that a person makes, you know. And 
what I found in all of the work and what the research seems to support is that finding the contacts where you can start talking about your loss and what you feel about that loss is a step in the right direction of healing. And ultimately, that's what Dinesh is doing with this film, opening the door to more and more people coming forth to talk about it. But you can't compel somebody to talk about it. Uh, what survivors also report is that that particular kind of death is more difficult to talk about than any other kind of loss. And there's, there's a hint of that, at least from my perspective, in this documentary as well. It's easier to talk about his dad's death by cancer and to be able to forgive. Dinesh says so powerfully, it's, it's easier for me to forgive my father than it is for me to forgive, let go my anger against my mother. Survivors say that. It's almost universal. You know, there's this conflict within them of, um, firstly, and that's also very beautiful in the documentary, Dinesh, I've got to say it. As a, it's not only as a child. Survivors spend their lives asking, could I have done something to stop this? Could I have done something? Could I have seen this coming? And Dinesh's older siblings, who were old enough to take on the responsibility of raising the younger kids, were adults. They, they have a slight, slight variation to what elements of grief they are experiencing as opposed to what six-year-old Dinesh was experiencing. And that's also what I meant by proximity. You know, sure. so um, compassion, I think, is the only answer. And ultimately, making the choice to forgive yourself, whether you caused it or not, is not important. It's like, what, I, what have you been telling yourself in the phrases that you use in the self-talk? Could I have done anything to prevent it? You, everyone did the best that they could with what they knew. Even the nation's mother did the best that she could with what she knew. But people die by suicide when their pain becomes unbearable. And they believe, and it's delusional thinking, but they believe in that moment that death will be preferable to life. You know, so we have to forgive them and we have to forgive ourselves. I think that's what the time allows us to talk about, but I would love to talk about it more. It's like a nice way to end, too, on that mm -hmm. note. Forgive ourselves, forgive each other, and just the, just the power of compassion. Thank you. Yeah. I think we are Great. out of time. Yeah. Thank you guys Thank so you much. Thank you. This was so Thank wonderful. You. Thank you. Thank you.